Is dat een meer, een, een betere benadering van het conflict, volgens u? Dat is volgens mij een correcte benadering. Hè. Um, je kent natuurlijk allemaal het verhaal van de Syrische opstand die is begonnen, uh, Assad die het geweld heeft gebruikt en vanaf daaraan is het geëscaleerd. Nu natuurlijk, ja, we kunnen, kunnen niet ontkennen dat die zaken zijn gebeurd, maar die spiraal van geweld die is ontstaan, heeft weinig te maken met de bezorgdheden en de wensen van de Syrische burger, maar inderdaad meer met het feit dat bepaalde regionale als ook grootmachten deze uh, onlusten hebben misbruikt om hun eigen voordeel eruit te halen. Dus van, vanaf dag één is de strijd in Syrië een geopolitieke strijd tussen verschillende partijen geweest. U laat in uw boek iemand aan het woord die helemaal in het begin in die Arabische lente um, uit protest tegen de corruptie van, uh, van, het, uh, van het Syrische regime mee protesteert, hè, een christen, maar die dan heel snel uh, tot de conclusie komt dit protest gaat helemaal niet over een strijd tegen corruptie. Nee, uh, we moeten van het Syrië van voor de oorlog ook geen te rooskleurig beeld scheppen. Hè. Het was inderdaad een corrupte staat, um, waar dat ook ja, mensenschendingen gebeurden. Hè. Iedereen met een foute mening kon in de gevangenis belanden, maar die martelingen waren ook echt. Dus de Syriërs zijn daar tegen allemaal op straat gegaan en die zorgen waren ook terecht. Dus we wilden inderdaad een ander Syrië. Maar hetgeen, het verhaal dat ik daar heb ge gehoord en ook heb neergeschreven was inderdaad, die protesten zijn meteen gekaapt door de grote, grootste politieke kracht in Syrië, namelijk het islamisme. En vanaf daar, en vanaf daar dan aan hebben veel mensen die op straat kwamen voor een beter Syrië, voor meer mensenrechten, tegen de corruptie, ook hun strijd verloren, want het werd meteen een politieke strijd voor een ander politiek systeem, ten voordele van islamisering, zoals de moslimbroeders het voorstelden. In een buurland van Syrië bent u ook geweest voor de opleiding die u gevolgd hebt voor internationaal onderzoeksjournalistiek in Libanon. Uh, en daar is op dit moment ook heel wat los. Wat is het probleem in Libanon? Zoals u dat gezien hebt, u bent er geweest. Goh, Libanon heeft natuurlijk ook heel veel problemen. Hè. Het is uh, na de burgeroorlog niet echt een stabiele staat meer geweest. Een staat uh, waarin de sectarische breuklijnen heel duidelijk zijn en waar dat iedere groep ook door een buitenlandse grootmacht wordt gesteund. Hè. De naam Hezbollah is iedereen wel bekend wordt gesteund door Iran, terwijl de Sunniten uh, door Saudi-Arabië worden gesteund. Dus in Libanon is er ook momenteel dezelfde proxy-oorlog bezig die men momenteel in Syrië als ook in Jemen ziet. Hè. De regionale macht, uh, machtsstrijd tussen de Shiitische grootmacht Iran en de Sunnitische grootmacht Saudi-Arabië. En een kwetsbare staat zoals Libanon is natuurlijk heel kwetsbaar om voor zulke strijd zich te lenen. Gaan we dan naar een nog grotere ontwrichting van het Midden-Oosten? Laat ons uiteraard hopen van niet. Hè. Ik denk dat de problemen in Syrië en de bredere regio al groot genoeg zijn. Mm -hmm. Maar inderdaad, als die proxyoorlog niet gaat liggen, is dat zeker een mogelijkheid. Goed, u hebt uh, twee extra gasten. Ik kijk eens hoe laat het is. Ja. Twee extra gasten. Misschien, terwijl we de beide mensen erbij halen, moet u toch eens uitleggen wie dat zijn. Uh, please join us. Um, mijn goede vriend Kevr Kamassian is een uh, Syrische Armeen, afkomstig uit Aleppo. Hij is ook een freelance journalist, heeft zijn eigen YouTube-kanaal, Syriana Analysis, sorry. Um, en heeft ook bijgedragen aan het boek. En aan mijn rechterkant is uh, Elijah Manier. Hij is oorlogscorrespondent bij Al Rai Newspaper, een Kuwaitse krant. Kevork, let's start with you. Um, you told me you're originally from Aleppo, the region of Aleppo. Your parents went back to Aleppo last. Uh, How is the situation in Aleppo right now? Actually, after the liberation of Aleppo in uh, December 2016, um, a lot of people tried to go back to Aleppo in order to check their properties, their shops, their business, what, what happened in, uh, in Aleppo, to see in their own eyes. Uh, my family, my parents went back uh, almost two or three weeks ago to Aleppo in order to check what happened, and our shops were entirely destroyed in Aleppo. So he started to reconstruct these shops. However, uh, there is no governmental-backed uh, initiative, let's say, in order to, uh, for the people to reconstruct their properties. So everybody is doing it on an individual level. Uh, my father is, uh, for example, he found someone to reconstruct it. People are helping each other for in, in reconstruction. But the business uh, is not like before uh, 2011, of course, because the borders are still closed with Turkey and uh, our companies had been all dismantled and sent to Turkey uh, during the crisis. Uh, the, 
this rebels, quote unquote, they uh, dismantled the factories in Aleppo, more than uh, 1,150 factories, heavy high-tech uh, factories, and they sold them in, in Turkey. So Aleppo was the center of uh, the economy, let's say, the it was the economical uh, capital of Syria. And now uh, we are deprived from this strength. So uh, the people are trying to reconstruct, but at the same time, they need uh, a backing uh, for them from the government, but also from the uh, governments who are allied or friendly governments uh, with Syria in order for them to help in the, in the reconstruction. They cannot do it alone. How many people are going back or went back or stayed even in, in Aleppo? How, how many people are there right now? The problem is during the war, a lot of youngsters left from Aleppo. This is uh, deprived Aleppo from the manpower. Uh, so basically the elders are going back, like my father, the father of my friends. They, they want to go back to see their properties. But this is not enough because uh, for us as youngsters now, we don't have uh, the, uh, let's say, a light to, to see in the at the end of the tunnel in order to go back to Syria. Uh, a lot of places have been destroyed. Uh, we th there is no uh, employment for us uh, in order to return back. So uh, on a personal level, I would prefer to study now in, in Europe and to wait for the situation to calm down a little bit and for the market to be uh, stable in order to go back and help in, in a different way, in an intellectual way, in the, in, in the educational sector, for example. This is my, this is my plan uh, for, for the future. Elijah, you're an international cor correspondent. How, how do you watch the situation right now in Syria? It's the end of ISIS. Is it the end of the war? I think it's pretty much the end of the war. We're coming toward the end of the military war. But this is not the end of the instability in Syria. We still have a Turkish occupation forces in the north of the country. We have the Americans who are not invited in the northeast uh, of the country, uh, in the Kurdish area. Uh, we still have Al-Qaeda in a big part of the north in Idlib city, in the south, close to Dara, and we still have pockets of ISIS in the Golan area next to the uh, uh, Syrian-Israeli borders. And we still have some pockets of ISIS in the north, west of the country. There was an agreement between Russia and uh, the United States last Friday. Is that a good point for Syria? Does it bring hope? There's a lot of speculation about the agreement. Which agreement are you talking <laughs> about? The last agreement uh, they were in Vietnam, uh, where the two ministers uh, had an agreement. There was no military solution for um, Syria. Well, since over six years, we know there is no military solution in Syria, but it took six years for the international community to understand that. Now, I think the uh, Americans and the Russians understand that there is no military solution. I think the Syrians are starting to understand there is no military solution, but I think there is uh, still a lot to be done, mm -hmm. uh, a reconciliation mainly between the government and other Syrians who disagree with the government, and a big part who agree with the government. Both live on the same land, on the same territory, and they need to get together and agree and talk to each other. Is that possible? Of is, course is, it is, is the, possible, Is yeah. the gap between, yeah, they fight it for more than seven years. Is it possible to talk, or is there no, no other option? It took the Syrians seven years to realize that the military solution is not a solution. Mm -hmm. I think they're pretty much close to this convention now. And they know that by the use of force, uh, they can only get the destruction of their country between 300 and 500 billion dollars. There are um, millions of refugees, mm -hmm. hundreds uh, of thousands of uh, displaced internally. There are thousands of wounded. And now they understand that they have to stop the war and start talking. But what's next? OK, there is still war right now. There is uh, there's an enormous amount of money needed to rebuild uh, Syria. But there's also a political problem. 
which way does Syria have to go politically? Actually, before we come to the end of the war, as uh, our colleague uh, mentioned, uh, we still have some uh, work against ISIS because they still uh, uh, occupy three or four percent of the Syrian territories. We still have Al Qaeda. So the, the process of reconstruction needs political stability, mi military stability in Syria in order to continue because we cannot uh, co reconstruct, uh, uh, the, the, uh, for example, the factories in, in, uh, in, in Aleppo and then uh, the, the Turkish uh, side turn against these arguments and reoccupy uh, Aleppo and destroy it once again. So uh, the, 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 the stability needs not only an agreement between the internal players, but also the regional players, and especially I mention here Turkey. Uh, Turkey is an essential player in, in, the, in the Syrian conflict, and it was uh, for six, six and a half years was uh, fiercely against the Assad government. But now after the rapprochement with, uh, with, uh, with Russia, their rhetoric is a little bit uh, minimized, let's say, against, uh, against uh, the, the Syrian government. But because there is another obstacle here, which is the Kurdish question. The Kurdish question, in my opinion, is one of the important things in the, f the future of Syria on a strategic level because uh, the Kurdish separatists, and I mean only the separatists, who want to divide Syria and take part of the, the land, of the Syrian land, and create their own state, uh, uh, they are doing this with the backing of the United States. So to what extent the Americans are willing to go with the Kurds to create their own federal, uh, federal system in, in, in Syria? This is a question that we need to wait and see if the Americans are ready to go to the end with the Kurds or not. In my, es in my estimation, I believe the Americans are not ready to uh, have uh, military presence, strong military presence in, si in, in Syria, especially in front of the public, because they told we are fighting ISIS. So what after ISIS, will the American people be convinced that we need thousands of uh, American troops in the Kurdish areas in order to protect uh, the Kurdish separatists against who? Against the Syrian government. The Syrian government is the legitimate government that has the right to have entire control over the territory. This is an international law and in our constitution. The Kurds uh, uh, are our uh, brothers and sisters in Syria and we are more than 22 ethnicities uh, sects, religious sects in Syria. So what if another uh, uh, communities, ethnicities want their part of the cake? What if the Armenians came one day and said, we are the majority in Kassab and we want our own country? That means the division of Syria into 22 states. And this is not possible.